Hi, this is Web Yeshiva with Rabbi Jeff Sachs, uh, continuing our studying, getting very near to the end of our study of Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik's Halachic Man. Over the past many months, we've been making our way through a very careful reading of Halachic Man. Our course is sponsored by Michael and Tiffany Beda in memory of Rabbi Ezra Labaton, Zichron Lovracha. Visit that link, webyeshiva.org forward slash Rabbi Labaton, for a kind of roundup of links to Rabbi Labaton's drashot and sheorim and writings, some of which relates to the teachings of his great Rebbe, Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, the, uh, we've had a little break uh, for uh, Sukkot, and now we're back. Um, this will be something of an abbreviated, uh, s- abbreviated semester. You can take a look on the webpage to see the dates that we are and are not meeting. Um, but I hope that we'll be able to, in the next number of weeks, finish up what's left uh, in, in Ish Halacha. We have only about um, another 15 or 14 pages left uh, to get through, and then the attempt to try to summarize what it is that we've done. Uh, the first long section of the first part, part one of the two-part uh, book or monograph or, or, or essay is this description of the personality of halachic man and how he relates both to these other two counterparts, the religious man, homo religiosis, and cognitive man, and how in some ways he's like this, in some ways he's like that. The differences between them or amongst them, you'll remember that chart that we used again and again and again to, uh, to differentiate uh, their, different, uh, their different personalities and their, their identities and what their focuses are and um, things, uh, things of that nature. And now in the second part of the essay, we have these different, each little chapter we're now about to start chapter five on page 123. Each little chapter is almost kind of like a standalone essay on its own, examining the larger theme of creativity, uh, creativity as the kind of litmus test of the ishalacha, of the, you know, the kind of identifying characteristic of, of uh, halachic man. Uh, but each chapter really does to a certain degree stand on its own, although we saw last time how certain themes begin to build on, on earlier ones, but each one can really be taken on its own. And this, this time we're talking about the problem of the individual, the problem of the individual and creativity. Let me just make this a little bigger. Here we are, chapter 5 on page 123. The old problem of the status of the individual, which has its roots in the philosophy of Aristotle, and for a long time engaged attention of Christian Arab scholastics, found both its clearest expression and its most profound and original solution in the philosophy of Maimonides. The Rambam, in Jewish philosophy that is, uh, uh, had the most uh, clearest, had the clearest expression, the most profound and original solution to the problem of the individual, the status of the individual. Now, what is the problem of the status of the individual will become clear as we go on, but the reference here to Aristotle reminds us of um, of something uh, kind of, you know, those of us that studied philosophy in college or something, will we'll remember that Aristotle talked about about uh, the difference between form and nature. Uh, that uh, this is a triangle, or at least a poor sketch of a triangle. Um, but that there's this idea of a kind of abstract notion of what a triangle is, what triangularity is. This kind of ideal, um, ideal. Uh, abstract notion of the of the pristine or the ideal triangle, and then this is a triangle, uh, just like you can imagine that th- there's a chair. I happen to be sitting on one. Probably each of you are sitting on on one. And each chair is unique in its own chairness, um, and there are certain things that we would recognize 
as a chair or being chair-like uh, because, well, we, we know it when we see it, even though they all may be very different. And then there's this kind of abstract notion of a chair. Dogs. We, we have a notion of, that we know what a dog is, but then you look at a little, uh, at a, at a, at a St. Bernard, and then you look at a, at a, um, a Chihuahua, and you understand that there are dogs and there are dogs. Each one, as an individual, it bears some kind of uniqueness. Um, my father-in-law, Zechron Lebracha, would have already uh, reminded me that the term unique can't take any qualifiers. Something either is or isn't unique. You can't be somewhat unique. You can't be very unique. Uh, but he was a stickler for those kinds of things, rest his soul. Um, but uh, the idea that in some way, well, in this case though, really, you can say somewhat unique because on one level, all dogs are alike. There is something that they all share uh, and there's something, uh, there's some element of dogness that all, that all dogs share, that all chairs share, that all triangles share. And on the other hand, each one is separate unto itself. Um, even things that actually appear identical. Um, take, I don't, know, I don't know, pull out of your pocket, uh, you know, five coins that are identical. They all look the same. They all minted the same year. They all, they all, they're all just as shiny, etc. Uh, but yet we understand that each one is, each one is separate. Uh, this, in a very different context, the Rambam discusses what it means when we, we say that God is one. When we say that God is one, it's a different oneness than when we say, well, here I have, you know, I might, I might have, uh, let's say, I don't know, I might have three gold coins. And they might even all, you know, look, look the same. But it's not fair, it's not, it's not, true or accurate to say that this coin is one because in some way it isn't one. In some way it isn't separate and unique because all of these coins, all of the items in this set, all of the dogs in the world, all of the chairs in the world, all of the triangles in the world make up part of this larger abstract whole of what does it mean to be a dog or a chair or a triangle. This is what the rub is referring to in the reference to Aristotle. The problem of the individual. How do we relate to the individual? How do we relate to the individual dog or the individual coin, the individual triangle? And then how do we relate to it as part of something larger? Now, when it comes to homo sapiens, when it comes to human beings, it's more complicated still because there is a kind of commitment, there is a kind of notion that each person, although we're all part of a larger species, we're all part of a larger race, we're all part of a larger community, a larger family, but each individual really, in fact, is unique. And then how does that express itself? And what is it that gives distinction to each human in a way that we're not prepared to assign distinction to each and every other thing that makes up a set, dogs or cats or coins or triangles or chairs? Ah, okay, thank you, Peter, for uploading a link to this question of Aristotelian forms. So that Aristotle distinguishes between the nature of things, dogs, and the form of things, Fido or Rex or Lassie. Well, let's go back. So this problem had its most profound and original solution in the philosophy of the Rambam. Obviously, the view of Averroes, Averroes, who was also known, it was known, it was an Arabic philosopher, was uh, lived in Spain, 
uh, in the in the uh, in the twelfth century, more or less contemporaneous to uh, to the Rambam. And of course, although the Rambam was born in Spain, he leaves Spain as a child and spends his teenager years, uh, early adult years, uh, running across running across North Africa, and then spends his his adult life in uh, in Egypt. But uh, Vero is in, in Egypt is known as, as Ibn Rushd, R U S H D. Um uh, Averroes, uh obviously the view of Averroes that only the universal active intellect is immortal and not the individual passive intellect contradicts the very foundations of Judaism. The Jewish view, Maimonides disagreed with with Averroes, um, as did other uh, medieval religious philosophers. Um, uh, believe that the individual intellect has immortality, that after we die, all that remains of us is our intellect, whatever that means without, without going into it. But the idea that our intellect is what then plugs in to the sechel, sechel hapoel, the active intellect of God, once we're separated from once we're separated from our our physicalness is the mainstream Jewish view. Nevertheless, the whole question of the immortality of the soul, particularly as it re- relates to the individual passive intellect, is a very difficult and important one. And here Maimonides appears in his full intellectual and ethical splendor as he resolves this problem in a brilliant and striking fashion. On the one hand, Maimonides subscribed to the view of Aristotle and Plato that true, authentic existence is to be found only in the realm of the forms, the universal ideas, while the realm of particularity rooted in matter is an individuating principle. So on one hand, the truth exists in that kind of ideal abstract, and any actual uh, 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 take geometric forms. Um, there's this kind of ideal circle. There's a kind of ideal triangle or a straight line that actually does connect two dots, two dots that are actually connected by a real straight line. But in reality, in reality, you know, if we had a, a calibrating instruments that were precise enough, you know, we would discover that there really is no straight line. There really is no ideal uh, platonic triangle or circle uh, because reality is, is messy. Uh, this goes back to what we talked about in, in, in earlier in Halachic Man, uh, the correspondence between between um, the correspondence between, let's say, like the blueprint and the building, um, that difference, difference between the kind of platonic ideal and the and the implementation of it in in the disworldly. Um, so that idea that when you when you look at the at the at the um, abstractified the abstractified uh, ideal as it exists in theory or on paper and then discover how it's put into practice here in, in this world in an imperfect way, so that you look at the imperfect implementation of the building or the examples that we gave earlier, the, 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 um, the symphony, right, as it's actually played versus how it exists on the page. Um, so which is, which is the real? Well, obviously, on one hand, the real, the actual, the authentic is the one that actually exists in this world. The building you can actually enter, the, the piece of music you can actually listen to. But it's inauthentic in the sense that it's always going to have some level of, of imperfection. How can you point them? Beauty contests aside, we all know the the flaws of uh, the, the, the inanity 
of beauty contests uh, or dog shows. But like, what is it? What is it? What is an ideal dog? What would it look like? Well, it wouldn't actually correspond to any one real dog that we that we have. You know, sometimes you see on the internet these these kinds of um, uh, uh, photoshopped images where they show you like what ideal beauty looks like. This kind of notion where they try to boil down, distill the mass uh, uh, sense of what what real beauty is to some kind of formula and then they Photoshop an image of a man or a woman to correspond to that. They always look like a little bit a little bit like plastic. They always look like a Ken doll or you know or something. It's not in this world you can't really have that. Uh, when you try to actually uh, actually demonstrate it visually, it, you're doing damage to the abstract, raw, platonic ideal. Um, so here to go back, the, the view that on one hand Maimonides agrees with the view that true authentic existence is to be found only in the realm of the forms, the universal ideals, while the realm of particularity rooted in matter uh, does not attain the level of complete being but exists only as an image of the universal. On the other hand, the halakha has always insisted on the principle of individual immortality. How can these two apparently contradictory positions be maintained? So once you, once you get to the question of humanity, so how can it be that, that every, every human has this potential to reach immortality, through the intellect that is, um, has the ability to really attain that level of abstract perfection when each of us is as imperfect as as every dog is from some kind of distilled idea of of perfection so the 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 trick to this puzzle has something to do with creativity. It, interestingly, I, I want to qualify what I said earlier when I said that each of these essays stands alone. It stands alone in the sense that each of them deals with a, a, a different theme, um, but uh, you see how this is building on ideas that we, that we had touched on earlier in the, in the work. The same problem reappears in the discussion surrounding the issue of providence, of hashkacha, of divine providence, of how God is involved with guiding and interacting with each and every individual. For certainly the belief in individual providence, hashkacha pratit, where am I? Here we are, top of page 124, is a cornerstone of Judaism, both from the perspective of the halakha and from the perspective of philosophical inquiry. It is the tenth of Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. And we believe that God is personally involved in the lives of individuals. The protagonist of the religious drama, according to Judaism, is the individual, responsible for his actions and deeds. And there can be no responsibility or accountability without providence. In other words, if God isn't concerned with us as individuals, how can we each be held accountable for our own actions? Therefore, Maimonides placed man in a special category by himself, distinct from that of all other creatures, and proclaimed that man's own particular existence as an individual is of significance, both with reference to the principle of immortality, immortality of the soul, of the intellect, and the principle of individual providence. In other words, in other words, uh, man, humanity, is a yotze dofen. It's an exception to the general rule, and he's going to demonstrate how this is. As for my own belief with regard to this fundamental principle, quoting the Rambam in the Morinavuchim in the Guide to the Perplexed. The meaning of divine providence, it is as I shall set forth for you. In the belief that I shall set forth, I am relying upon that which was clearly, that 
what has clearly appeared as the intention of the Book of God and the books of our prophets. Divine providence in our world watches only over the individuals belonging to the human species and that in this species all the circumstances of the individuals and the good and evil that befall them are consequent upon their, their deserts. Just as it says, for all his ways are justice. But regarding all the other animals and all the more plants and other things, my opinion is that of Aristotle, who rejected the idea of Hashgacha Pratit. For all these texts, asserting that there is providence over animal, refers to providence watching over the species and not individual providence. God is not actually concerned about each and every cat and each and every dog. He is, however, concerned about cats and about dogs. In other words, as opposed to as opposed to humanity, where God takes an interest and an involvement and holds accountable each and every one of us on our own accord, animals I'm sorry, folks, hold on one second, please. Sorry. Um, God is not concerned with, with each and every individual in the animal kingdom or in the plant kingdom, but he is concerned with species. And here you really do see something, um, something interesting. It has to do with the uniqueness of man. That idea that we, that we, that we read, Rashi read in, uh, Rashi mentions in um, in uh, in Breshit about Cain and Hevel about Dmei Ochicha that each individual contains whole universes and that and that the the um, the necessity and the requirement to show respect for each individual. And the uniqueness of each individual is because each person is, is quite literally a species unto himself. The death of any one person is tantamount to the extinction of an entire species. So in terms of hashkacha pratit, in terms of, in terms of God's involvement with the universe, God's not controlling whether or not any particular stray dog gets run over by a car on the highway. But he does have a concern that any one species should not go extinct. And that concern is paralleled in the concern that he has for each individual. The death of any one individual, and that's the meaning of the Gemara and Sanhedrin. Kol hamatzil nefesh achat ki ilu ki em olam umlo'o. That saving a life is like saving an entire world. And the opposite, that uh, causing, causing the loss of a life is like causing the destruction of an entire world. But that applies only to, only to humans. Uh, it does not follow for me that by virtue of this opinion, one may pose to me the following question. Namely, why does he, meaning God, watch over the human individuals and not watch over the same of his individuals belonging to the other species of animals? For he who propounds this question ought to ask himself, why did God give intellect to man and not to the other species of animals? The answer to this last question is, he willed it so. So there's this question of, this question of why, uh, why it should be that God uh, uh, pays attention to each and every individual, uh, but not to each, each and every individual person, but not each and every individual animal, it begs the question. In other words, why did he set us at the top of the food chain? Why did he set us at the top of the intellectual food chain? Why are we endowed with an intellect 
uh, created B'Tselem Elohim means not that we physically resemble God, for he has no physical form, but that we most closely resemble him in, in intellect, in our ability to think. And just to jump a gun, you'll, you'll, you'll be mindful of the fact that the ability to think, to reason, moral reasoning, is in fact... I mean, and don't tell me, like, don't pull out that National Geographic that, that will tell you that dolphins can do this or m- monkeys can do that. We understand that, that humans, not just because, as Rashi says, we're in possession of language, uh, but because we have the ability to reason in a way that other species don't have, language perhaps being connected to that, um, uh, that really does set us apart from the rest of the species of animals on the planet. And although we've discussed numerous times, in many ways, we are no different than the beasts of the field. But nevertheless, there is something divine within us that, that does set us apart. So the question is, like, why does God take interest in each and every individual, you know, Thanks, question. Well, why did he make humanity categorically different than all the other animals? The answer to that is he willed it so, which is a kind of way of saying, well, because he's God. Like, why does it, why is this? Because that's the way he wanted it. The gist of Maimonides' view is that man occupies a unique position in the kingdom of existence and differs in his ontological nature from all other creatures. With reference to all of the creatures, only the universal, not the particular, has a true continuous existence. With no respect to man, with, with respect to man, however, it is an everlasting principle that his individual existence also attains the heights of true eternal being. And because of that, because each and every individual is a world unto himself, each and every individual has to have some kind of eternality. And that is the eternality eternality of the soul, eternality of the, of the intellect. Okay. The primary mode of man's existence is the particular existence of the individual who is both liable and responsible for his acts, which is not true about other animals. Therefore, it's the individual who is worthy of divine providence and eternal life. Man, in one respect, is a mere random example of the biological species, species man. On some level, like all chairs are chair-like, like all dogs are door-like, dog-like, like all triangles are some kind of reflection of this ideal triangle, that there's certain properties, certain abstract properties that can then be embedded in this world, in, in this shape. It, on one level, in one respect, man is a mere random example. Any given man, any given person is a mere random example of the biological species. Right? You look up Homo sapien in the, in, the, uh, in the encyclopedia, and you could see a picture of any one of us. An image of the universal, a shadow of true existence, like, the, like any given coin is a shadow of the platonic coin. In another example, in another respect, he is a man of God, possessor of an individual existence. The difference between a man who is a mere random example of the biological species and a man of God is that the former is characterized by passivity, the latter by activity and creation. So the degree to, the degree to which each of us can individuate and rise above species man and rise above being just a, a kind of projection of of an abstract into this world, in which case we're all just members of a species, we're all just dogs, we're all just chairs, we're all just coins. 
is our ability to overcome passivity, to strive for activity, and for creation, to be creative, in that we are creative, we express our individuality, and if we can express our individuality, then God really does need to take note of us, each and every one, as individuals. And if each and every one of us is an individual, so then there has to be something about us that's everlasting. And that's the path to immortality. You know, remember, uh, remember what Woody Allen said. Some people want to live forever through their children. I want to live forever by not dying. But that is turned around on its head here. We want to be, we want to live forever through the creation, through that which we create. Children being just a part of that, I, I, I presume. There's more to be said on that topic. The man he belong, who belongs solely to the realm of the universal is passive to an extreme. He creates nothing. The man who has, right, look at all of those dogs. There's been millions and billions of dogs uh, on the planet every day for the past, you know, however many thousands of years. But every dog is just like the dog that came before him. No dog has added anything. And I'm a big dog fan. There's one roaming around my house right now. But no dog has added anything to dogness that any other dog hadn't added. That's not true about humanity. You know, the Pope, he said that, you know, this Pope, he's a very interesting guy. So he said that it could be that there's evolution. Could be there was a Big Bang. This is a pretty radical thing. I think he's going to get himself into some kind of trouble. They're going to put him into Hiram. Um, I, I, for one, am not disturbed by the idea of evolution or the theory of evolution. I'm not at all disturbed by the idea. I've mentioned this before in other contexts, that humans and chimpanzees share more DNA than mice and rats. That we're genetically closer to chimpanzees are than mice are to rats. And that doesn't lessen faith. On the contrary, I think it, I think it heightens faith because you really do see that we are not defined by our DNA. We are not defined by our by our physical creation. The difference, the 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 spark that that does set us above the apes, that does set us above the slugs, that's what's interesting. That's what's significant. Right? The fact that the fact that Every chimpanzee is just like every other chimpanzee. But every person is not like any other person. And the fact that there are people that can, through activity, through creativity, add something, create something, innovate something, in any field that we can have, you know, we can have a chafetz chaim, and we can have a Vladimir Horowitz. That you, can, you know, like, those are two very different realms of creativity. But they're each the mark of, they're each the mark of being endowed with Selim Elohim, being endowed with the creative capacity, being endowed with something that allows each person to be unique and to be a world and a species unto himself. I don't know what that means when you say chimpanzees have individual personalities, but no chimpanzee, no chimpanzee can do something which advances the cause of of chimpanzeehood, which is not true about 
about humanities. I mean, dogs also have different personalities. Hamsters have different personalities, right? Goldfish have different personalities. Some swim around this way and some swim around that way. Some are the first to go up for the food and some wait for it to sink to the bottom. But no one goldfish changes that category above of the abstract goldfishhood, which is not true about humanity. You, know, you have to look at any, at any one person and see some more, some less. Some, unfortunately, don't succeed in doing it, but that each person has the capacity to has the capacity to, to, to carve out a new world. Right? Well, Peter mentions writing, but writing is a function of language, and I mentioned that earlier. Uh, that's Rashi's position. That language is, is, this, is the marker of this, of this individual creativity. Um, But this is all, of course, dependent upon man himself. And I remind you of, don't get hung up on the gender-specific language. There's nothing here that's referring to, to men and not women, men meaning the species of humanity. The choice is his. He may, like the individual of all other species, exist in the realm of the images and shadows, or he may exist as an individual who is not part of the universal and who proves worthy of a fixed, established existence in the world of the forms and intellects separated from matter. And again, this is the Rambam. This is the Rambam, but he's, the Rambam is referring to what we mentioned earlier from Aristotle. Species man or man of God, those are the choices. Right? Species man means you know, you're a man like all others, like, like every dog is like all other dogs, or you're a man of God. To be a man of God means to be creative, means to find your own uniqueness. And through that uniqueness, to be worthy of God's individual attention instead of merely his species attention. This is the alternative which the Almighty placed before man. If he proves, if man proves worthy, then he becomes a man of God. And all the splendor of his individual existence that cleaves to absolute infinity and the glorious divine overflow. If he proves unworthy, here at the top of page 126, if he proves unworthy, meaning if he proves to be not unique, then he ends up as one more random example of the biological species, a turbid and blurred image of universal existence. I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Man at the bottom here, page 126, man at times exists solely by virtue of the species, by virtue of the fact that he was born a member of that species, and as a general form is engraved upon him. Again, clearly, on one hand, we are all merely rats in the maze. He exists only, solely, on account of his participation in the idea of the universal. He is just a member of the species man, an image of the universal. He is just one more example of the species image of its ongoing morphological process. He himself, however, has never done anything that could serve to legitimate his existence as an individual. There are plenty of people that do not achieve this, achieve the ideal. His soul, his spirit, his entire being are all are grounded in the realm of the universal. His roots lie deep in the soil of faceless mediocrity. His growth takes place solely within the public domain. He has no stature of his own, no original individual personal profile. He has never created anything, never brought into being anything new, never accomplished anything. Oh, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, it's like, the, it's like the brochure for a midlife crisis. Such a person is receptive passive, a spiritual parasite, wholly under the influence of other people and their views. Never has he sought to render an accounting, either for himself or the world. Never has he examined himself, his relationship to God and his fellow man. 
He lives unnoticed and dies unmourned. Like a fleeting cloud, a shadow, he passes through life and is gone. Because he doesn't attain immortality through the creativity. And that's why creativity is the solution to the problem of the individual. That's how when we look at humanity, and again, already from Aristotle, you look at humanity and you say, like, you know, it can't be that the species of humanity is the same as the species of goldfish. There has to be something different. But how could it be? We're all just, you know, passing through. We're all just, you know, like a herd of sheep. How are we not like a herd of sheep? Right? It's like that old Far Side cartoon. Uh, I'm sure I could find it. The old Far Side cartoon um, with the penguins. You know, they're all black and white. Um, they're all black and white, and they're they're standing there on the on the iceberg. Oh, here it is. Let's see if I can just post this up here. How do I do this? How do I? All right, let me... Uh... Here you go. That old far side cartoon. There it is. All the penguins gathered together, all black and white, they all look at Exactly like, and one penguin shouts out, I gotta be me, oh, I just gotta be me. So in the, um, there was, I, I saw once in, in one of the books, one of the Farsight books, so there was like a colorized version of this, where they, where they, um, where somebody, where, not, not Larson, not the artist, where they colorized this one, this one thing to show that he was he and Larson wrote that that the whoever had done that for the calendar for whatever completely missed the point. <laughs> the point is that he, he looks exactly like everyone else, but yet still desires to find some kind of individuality. But plenty of people go through life just like the herd of sheep, just like the just like the you know the flock of penguins. They're all, each one indistinguishable to the next. I mean, at least to us, maybe to each other, they look different, but, you know, who knows. Um, but, that, but none of them are doing anything that's not just carrying out their genetic programming to go and, you know, take that march to the sea and to catch their fish and to lay their egg and to, like the salmon swimming upstream, following its genetic programming, so that no one salmon, you know, for all intents and purposes, really is different than any other salmon, right? If you catch one salmon, if you, if you kill one salmon to make locks, right? it's no bigger or less tragedy for any other salmon because they really all are the same which is not true for a person who can distinguish himself. Unfortunately, and the rub gives this whole long depressing, uh, this whole long depressing uh, 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 description of like the, the, the people that don't get it done, who pass through life are gone. But creativity is, is, creativity is the path that we can achieve something. And creativity is all forms. Now, the Rub does not talk about so much artistic creativity, uh, but he's talking about intellectual creativity and, and even more so moral creativity, moral activity of, of really, that's why I give the example of Chavit Chaim, of Reb Chaim Brisker, of, of other giants of the spirit who, who understood that we can distinguish ourselves through our actions. And, and maybe even maybe even less so our actions, Benadam Lamakom, 
as our actions in the, in, the, in the human realm. There is another type of man. One who does not require the assistance of others, who does not need the support of the species to legitimate his existence. Such a man is no longer a prisoner of time, but is his own master. He exists not by virtue of the species, but solely on account of his own individual worth. His life is replete with creation and renewal, cognition and profound understanding. He lives not on account of his having been born, but for the sake of life itself, and so that he may merit thereby life in the world to come. He recognizes the destiny that is his, his obligation and task in life. He understands full well the dualism running through his being and that choice which has been entrusted to him. The dualism being, on one hand, we're all the same, we're all just part of one species, we're all sheep in the flock. On the other, that we're each of us individuals. We each of us have that potential. He knows that there are two paths before him, and that whichever he shall choose, there must he go. He is not passive, but active. His personality is not characterized by receptivity, but by spontaneity. Not by simply abandon, he does not simply abandon himself to the rule of the species, but blazes his own individual trail. Moreover, he, he as an individual, influences the many, a kind of leadership. His whole existence, like some enchanted stream, rushes as ever onward to distant magical regions. He's dynamic, not static, does not remain at rest, but moves forward in an ever-ascending climb. For indeed, it is the living God for whom he pines and longs. This is the man of God. This is the person that finds individuality, and through that individuality, creativity, and through that creativity, eternality. The fundamental of providence of Hashkacha is here transformed into a concrete commandment, an obligation incumbent upon man. It's the idea that God takes concern with each and every individual, that God has a personal relationship with each and every individual, is not a schut. It's not, it's not a merit. It's not something that we're entitled to. It's something that we can achieve. It's our responsibility to seek out that relationship. How do we seek out that relationship? By being individuals. By being individuals finding that individual by through creativity and part of that creativity is creating ourselves man is obliged to broaden the scope and str- and that's why remember go back to the earlier section on chuva chuva repentance as a creative act because repentance as a creative act is about creating recreating yourself to say, I'm not that person that did those things. I can be someone else. I can be someone better. That act of self-creation is itself a way of attaining, attaining the immortality. Man is obliged to broaden the scope and strengthen the intensity of the individual providence that watches over him. Everything is dependent on him. It is all in, his, in man's hands. When a person creates himself, ceases to be a mere species man, and becomes a man of God, then he has fulfilled that commandment which is implicit in the principle of providence. Again, the, the commandment, the mitzvah of hashkacha, is not just that God is watching over us, but the obligation that we have to be worthy of his attention. Because it's not a given that he should be concerned with each and every one of us, that he should be attentive to each and every one of us. We, we must earn it, and we earn it through our creative individuality. The apex, the, the model uh, of this is the person of the prophet, of the Navi. The Navi is someone who has perfected himself to such a degree that Hashkacha not only takes note of him, but that God actually communicates to and through him, and that is the subject of chapter 6, which we will take up next week. 
Yeah, so Anne, Anne writes, there's got to be more to this because there are creative and active people who are truly evil, and those don't live eternally, do they? No, so obviously not. In other words, you can, you can, you can be individual and use it for, for the good or for the evil. And, and because God does, since there is Hashgacha Pratit, God holds everybody accountable for their own, for their own actions. So as you can be an individual for evil, and then you're held accountable for your own actions, and depending upon the scope of your evil, you either have karate and you're cut off and you're not getting into the eternal plug-in of the eternal mind, um, or there's still room for you to do for you to do chufa. But that's precisely it. In other words, all of these concepts are related. The, the idea of reward and punishment is bound up with the idea of hashkacha pratit. Because if there was no hashkacha pratit, then we wouldn't be accountable for our actions. But since we are, so then there has to be a possibility for, for hashkacha. Next week, we'll continue from page 128 with chapter 6. Correct, Peter. Animals are not good or evil. That's why they're not individually counted. Well, I've, I've mentioned this before. When, when you, you're watching the National Geographic uh, you know, with your kids, and they think the lions are bad because they're eating the antelopes, that's ridiculous. It's such, a, it's, it's such an anthropomorphism. It's, it's putting our moral categories, which are unique to humanity, on a different species. And a lion is not evil because he eats the antelope. A lion is a lion because he eats the antelope. Tyrannosaurus Rex was not the bad dinosaur because he ate the other dinosaurs. You know, Tyrannosaurus Rex is always portrayed as the, you know, as the bad guy, the bully, the, the, the wicked one, the, the, the tyrant, right? You know, unfortunately, he has that name, Tyrannosaurus, right? But the Tyrannosaurus Rex is, is no more evil than the, than the plant-eating Triceratops because uh, he, he eats other animals because that's what he's designed to do. Right? Uh, uh, it's, it's this kind of anthropomorphic moralizing that we put values on them. So, so that's precisely the case. Right. Ebola is not evil. Ebola is just you know doing its doing its thing. It's our job. It's our job. We read the we read Parshat Breshi two weeks ago, and we remember back to the you know. I hope that on Simchas Torah and on on Parshat Breshi, you all you all remembered what we learned together in the Lonely Man of Faith about Adam one and Adam two and etc. It's our job to lavda l'shamra. It's our job to kibshua. It's our job to put together Adam one and Adam two, and to and to guide the world. Um, there's Ebola. We should try to get rid of it. Right? But Ebola itself is not evil because we can't judge Ebola on moral, in the same moral categories that humanity is judged by. Uh, Ebola is bad. I don't want it. Please keep it away from me. Don't let anybody else get sick. But it's, but it's, not, uh, it's not Hitler, even though it might have the capacity if left unchecked, to, to kill as many people. Um, okay, so we will continue next week with Chapter 6.